Hello and welcome to With Winning in Mind podcast. I'm your host, Troy Basham, and today we're going to interview Heather Sumlin. In case you all don't know about, about Heather Sumlin, uh, we're brother-sister, and we've been around mental management our whole life because our, obviously our dad founded it, created it, and we've been working for the company full-time, myself, since 2004, you, 2003. Mm -hmm. And so what most people might not be familiar with in general you know is that you are the pageant guru <laughs> and the the graded sports guru of the company okay sounds good is that, is that fair that's accurate yes so if you're if you're in a sport like diving for example figure skating pageantry something that judges are grading you on on your performance selective type grading heather is the one that works with probably 90% of those people, the clients are going to be working with you as opposed to anyone else in the, in the office. And so it's unique because I am opposite. I prefer to work in sports where it's pretty simple. You, you made the basket. You didn't make the basket. You, you hit the 10 ring. You didn't hit the 10 ring. The, the ball goes in the hole in golf or it doesn't go in the hole. I mean, it's, it's pretty straightforward. You know, it's more objective rather than subjective mm -hmm. type of thing. So, we're going to go in your history because I don't think people know your history, how you got involved and that kind of stuff because the pageantry goes way before you started working for the company. So let's go back to how you got involved into pageantry and you didn't follow the shooting path like Brian and, and I did. So okay. so take us from there. Okay. Well, I didn't follow the shooting path for um, a couple of different reasons. Number one, I really didn't want to compete against you guys. Um, and I, I just wasn't interested in it. it. It was, I felt like shooting was extremely boring because I, when I would go up to the range, nobody would talk. And it was a really long walk. We lived on 105 acres out in the middle of nowhere, and the range was, was on the opposite end of the property. And so you either had to drive a truck up there or walk up there and there was a lot of equipment involved, and I don't know. I just didn't really feel like it was something that interested me at all. And um, what did interest me was I liked to sing. I liked to think I could sing when I was elementary school, middle school. I liked to believe that I had a little bit of talent. Um, I did not actually have any talent <laughs> at that time. Honestly, when I go back and I look at some of the videos – I couldn't carry a tune in a bucket, but I wanted to learn. I was really excited about it. And what mom did, which was brilliant, is mom didn't judge me on my lack of talent. But what she did do is encourage me, if you continue to like it and you enjoy this and you should keep working. And then she hired a coach for me to kind of work with for my singing. And then she put me in a pageant and she entered me without explaining what a pageant was I'd never really watched on tv I didn't know and she said I've entered you in this contest in this competition and you get to sing this is what I heard I don't know what she said but what I heard was I've entered you in a contest where you get to sing I'm like great talent show right that's yeah. got to be what it is talent and you show. like to get in front of people that's not a yeah. problem so uh, extrovert. that you had down yeah no no big deal no big deal and in sixth grade I had been given in in sixth grade choir at school, the teacher gave me the Hidden Talent Award, right? Hidden Talent hidden Award. Hidden Talent Award because I was super quiet, but I did a solo. Oh. It was hidden. And, and it had come out. And so I was like, yeah, obviously I, I could do this talent thing. I just didn't realize there were other phases to this contest until I got into orientation. And then all of these girls were there that – I, I don't know what I thought pageant was, but I didn't understand that there was an interview process and you had to model and you had to wear a dress and you had all the things. I didn't get it. And we got in the car and I said, I'm not doing this. I am not under any circumstances doing this. No. Yeah, but you, you got said, one problem. You entered, you can't back out. Well, so Once that's how we were raised. Once you start something, you have to finish it. That was the rule growing up. <laughs> that was the rule. It, you, have, you have been entered. That's exactly what you said. I can't get my money back. I've already paid. You must do it. And you're uh, like, yeah, I don't want to. I tried to wiggle out of that every which way I could, and it, it didn't work. She made me follow through. So you're, what, Fine. 12, 13 at this time? 
Yeah, this was seventh. Yeah, I was 13. I was 13. Yeah. So I, was the, I think I was probably the youngest one in the competition, maybe. It was a, it was a local town. Preteen, teen type? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, pageant? Yeah, and I mean, and it was fun. It wound up being really fun. All the girls were great, and I knew a lot of them because I'm to school with them. So it was a lot of fun, um, and I realized that I really did like singing. I really did like being on stage for that portion of competition. So I continued to do the pageant because mom said, oh, well, Heather, I was told that you have to do three before you decide to give up on this. I'm like, I never decided to start it. Like, she started it. I didn't, you know. But she said, you have to do three. So the next year, a year later, entered it again. A year later, entered it again. And after those three, then I'm like, now I like this. Yeah, now you're 15. You're like, well, I got some stuff invested in this. I might as well keep trucking along, so to speak. Well, and I was improving, even though I wasn't, I didn't really have, there wasn't the the best of opportunity for, for prep in our area for pageantry, but... I was improving and I was getting a little bit better and I I started to enjoy some of the other phases of competition and then mom started to invest in different coaching up in the Dallas-Fort Worth area so we would drive up there and I would I get some help with stage presence and interview the and mecca like that. for pageantry in Texas DFW um, back at then that, at that point in time for the America system for sure and um and so I started you know I competed I participated I like to say I participated because before they had participation trophies. You didn't I, need a trophy to I participate. Have, you were ready to go. I would have solidly earned a participation trophy. I would have solidly earned that. I would. I didn't really earn any. <laughs> I. I did. I won a few things. I, I won some. I won some local titles and and things like that. But for me, the most important thing wasn't the awards that you won or the recognition or anything like that. What was important to me was the skills that I learned. I learned how to communicate with people, how to network with people, how to talk to a stranger at an event, how to make people feel welcome and important. And those things, those strategies, communication skills is what helped me. Yeah, it's similar to why do you compete in sports? You mm-hmm. compete in sports because it teaches you things that are going to help you with life skills that you don't necessarily learn in a classroom. Pageantry, I think, goes maybe even a couple of steps beyond sports. Because not only do you have to do the interaction thing, which is is huge in team sports, you have to learn how to communicate with people who are equal to you, people who are above you and below you. I mean, the coach is obviously above you. That's similar to uh, upper management when you get to business. But then you go, hey, I'm a senior on the team. I'm like the captain. But you got the new freshmen that are on the team. You got to kind of lead them. So they're not quite your equal, but they're not, but they're on the team. You know, so you, you get different levels and pageantry. I mean, these. You got a whole realm of different people with different experiences and that you're dealing with, throwing the different personalities, throwing the fact that they're all competing for the same thing, mm-hmm. right? And then the thing that I think is really cool about pageantry, which I did not get to really understand or figure out to years later, okay. like, like 10 years ago, <laughs> that's how long ago it was, is that networking is huge. Yeah. The people you meet mm-hmm. and then... The contacts beyond that, and we'll get into some of that later on, which is absolutely huge. So I get why people pursue pageantry now. Back when you were doing it, we were like, why would Heather want to do that? That's just dumb. We hated going. <laughs> you know, it's like, this is stupid. Why are we doing it? Similar to, oh, yeah, well, you're lugging 80 pounds worth of equipment to go stand yeah. for two hours to try to hit a little dot. In, you know, over and over. In the heat. <laughs> in, yeah, in the heat. So, so My hobby smart is air-conditioned. <laughs> yeah. Air condition, you get a you get a change from one one facet of the, the, the pantry to another. So it's it's not like the same thing over and over. You're doing something different. Oh, we got the talent section, then we mm-hmm. got the evening gown section, then with the on stage question, the interview section and that kind of stuff. So Well and but, every phase of competition matters towards building the overall participant. Yeah. And it, then of it, course you have the different types of pageants mm-hmm. that a, you approach things a little bit differently. I mean, they're all generally the same as far as what you're getting out of it. Mm-hmm. But the networking thing, at least from what I've seen with the USA and the America mm-hmm. system, it's just huge. Because what what do you do in life? You know, if you're going to own your own business, if you're going to work for a big company, mm-hmm. if you're going to go into anything that you're going to excel in, you're going to have to know people. You're going to have to connect with people. You're going to have to what? 
network. Yep. So I thought that was really, really huge. And you got to do that at a much younger age than what we did because you're not networking and rifle shooting. I guarantee you that. You're not <laughs> you're not talking to anybody. You're just sitting there for two and a half hours shooting. Okay, so we we wind up going into competitions. You compete throughout. Mm-hmm. But you also – didn't just compete. You also helped run an organization when you were in Colorado, didn't you? Yeah. So after I was through competing in pageantry, I, I kind of thought the whole pageant thing was over. But then I um, I judged a couple local competitions. And mom and I decided, and I, I don't really know why we decided that we should be a, a local director, but we wanted to continue on and, and do something. So we we had a local for a very short period of time in Colorado. And that helped me understand the other side of things. So understanding what it was like on the other side of the table as a judge, understanding what it's like on the other side as a as a director. I wish I would have known those things when I participated because I would have had a lot more patience, respect, um, discipline I think because I would have realized how much effort goes into everything and I I don't know that I really understood that as a participant until you're on the other side of the fence so what what is the difference between running versus competing you're running a a local organization basically right Mm -hmm. versus competing what what's the the big difference for you um honestly mom did a lot of the work running running the competition i i helped with some of the prep i helped with the recruitment i helped with you know the choreography of the of the opening number and i entertained and things like that so i did the fun part and mom did all the business stuff so i can't even get into like all of the stress and the struggle of how we're going to pay for things because that wasn't on my plate but um so i think there's a lot of differences that i that i don't even realize but when i participated honestly i didn't deal with the business things either because mom covered the finances. But for me, um, there's just as much pressure. It's just in a different way. I, I think when you're, when you're helping someone train, so as a coach now, when you're helping people train and you're in the audience and you know what, what they can do, what their potential is, you're sitting there kind of similar to their mom. Like, oh, oh come on, you can do it. You, you know, in your, in your head, you're like, oh, you can do this, you can do this, it's going to be great. And you have this investment in these in these women and so i i just think it's extremely rewarding and probably probably what i do now i feel like is more rewarding than anything i've ever done as far as just being able to help girls not just prepare for competition but prepare for life yeah and i think having that background even though you say you did the fun stuff understanding the the Mm -hmm. business side of the organization and how the pageantry runs even Mm -hmm. in a local or you know, beyond Mm -hmm. probably helps you help prepare these contestants a little bit better than if you were just competing and didn't really understand the other side of it. Would you, would you say that's an advantage or not? I I think it's an advantage to an extent because I understand how much work their directors are putting in. And I understand um, the need to realize that you're part of a team. So when you're when you're working, you're working alongside a team of people who are helping you prepare. So while you're the only one who's going to compete on stage, you have a team of people who's spending their time, energy, and effort. And depending on the pageant system, some of these people are doing it 100% for free. This is what they do as their volunteer efforts. This is how they give back to, to their community is to be a, a director or volunteer with an organization. And so respecting that and realizing, wow, there's a lot of people who care enough about me to spend their their free time helping me and being really gracious for that. I think it's important. So when you stop competing, stop mm-hmm. helping running an organization, how far was it, how much time elapsed before you got back into you know, pageantry? Because um, you actually got back in pageantry after you started working for mental management, right? Yeah, I started, I I came to mental management because um, I read with winning in mind for the first time. Uh, Dad wrote it when when I was in middle school. He wrote the original version in 1988. And then it wasn't until, I don't know, I'm in my mid to late 20s. And I read it finally for the first time because I, I felt like my environment was negative. 
I, I saw all the all the I don't know I guess I was looking at I was a single mom at this point I, I was looking at the things around me and I was finding all the negatives in everything around me and I wanted to move I just I wanted to physically move I wanted to uproot my kid and move away a thousand miles away because my one friend in this town knew yeah, of a job. Yeah, why share that share that story? So, because you read the book on the on the flight over, I think I read the book on the on the flight because what I knew, what the, the thing I knew, I had been in a seminar with Dad when I was a, a senior in high school, but my boyfriend was also in that seminar, and I, so I don't think I retained a thing. Now, how many of us are a senior listening to my, your mom or dad anyway? Not happening. Yeah, I mean, I could have gained a tremendous amount of value, but the only reason I even remember I was there was I found notes from that seminar not too awful long ago. Dad had given out like a workbook or whatever it was at that time, and I knew that the boyfriend was there because we were both doodling on it. Like that's my my recollection. I have no memory of this really. I just have proof that I was actually there. And I so I didn't retain – any any real mental management clearly i mean i knew some of the stuff intellectually cuz cuz dad would talk about it and around us and and he was definitely coaching you guys so i think that i gained some obviously from just being part of the family but i was i had gotten into this really negative place and i wanted to move as far away as possible yeah so this is a few years Go by. Yeah, a couple a couple years, and and I wasn't that mu- that long, but I was just like, wow, I don't like, I don't like what I'm doing. I don't like my job. I don't like the people I work with, which they were wonderful people. So if any of y'all that I worked with at the point in time, y'all were amazing. It was me. It was my attitude, yeah. and and my attitude was messed up. But were you in Colorado? Or are you back in Texas at this time? In Texas at this time, and I remember. I decided so one of my one of my really good friends at that time, probably my best friend at the time, lived in Denver, and she knew of a job that was available, and she said, "Heather, why don't you come up here? That'd be great, you know, because we're really good buds." Well, she's my one friend there, right? And so on on so that's the part of me that's like, "Yes, such a great idea. I'll take my I'll take my two year old or whatever to you know to Denver, Colorado. That sounds great." Um, Start over. Uh, yeah. Clean slate, all the things. There's a lot of worse places you can go than Denver, Colorado. Oh, I love Denver, especially if you like, if you like snow and the winter. Oh and, yeah. I mean, yeah. And and I mean, I had lived in Colorado Springs. I lived in Boulder. Like I I I could do I could do Denver, not a problem. And they had the Broncos. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. They were good. So what I saw was all of the what I needed to do was change my environment because it was my environment that was bad. Like that's what I thought. That's what I believed. And what I knew about what dad did, even though I didn't really pay close attention when I was growing up, was that he helped people to have confidence. Like, I thought he's a confidence builder. He can give me some confidence. I haven't done an interview in a really long time. I'm going to read. I'm going to read his book. And I'm going I'm to read that because that will give me a boost of confidence. And I'm going to go into this interview and I'm going to ace it. And by the time the plane landed, I had talked myself out of the job. Because I realized it wasn't where I was that was a problem. It was, it was who I was. I was the issue. I needed to change me. I needed to change the way that I looked at, at the things around me. I was letting the environment control my attitude. I wasn't controlling my own thoughts. My self-image was very small. Um, I had all the capability and skill in the world, but I didn't believe in myself. I needed to fix that. So I started applying some of the things in the book to myself. Now, I was offered that job in Denver, and I turned it down. And um, So everyone's going to know. Everyone's going to ask this. They're going to be like, well, how much did it pay? Uh, more, it- more than what I was making. I mean, it would have been it, – it, they offered me – and then they called me and offered me more, if I recall correctly. And I, I said no. And they, they probably um, were and it was, really it was frustrated a job by that me. You, were, you think you would have liked and excelled in. I don't know about that. I mean, that was that was one thing that made it easier for me to to say no. Is well, I would have been good at it because it was a lot of people skills. It was a lot of kind of sales, and I would have been really good at it. But I knew that it wasn't that wasn't the issue. If I would have taken that job, I would have uprooted all of the bad habits and attitudes I already had, and I would have taken them with me. So it, it's not like 
I would have changed. And then the environment would have been, it would have been new and that's exciting for the short term, but not for long because then I would have noticed all the negatives about that too because I had become a negative person. My self-image was I'm going to find what I don't like about something. I'm going to complain about it. That's who I had become and I needed to change that. So I started changing the way that I viewed my environment, the way I viewed the people that I worked with, the, what I noticed about people. Because a lot of times, the, if you want to find something you don't like about somebody, you can find it. But if you want to find something you do, you can find that too. And so you're going to make a choice. Like, what do you want to spend your time focusing on? Something that's helpful or harmful? You get to choose. And so I started doing that and I became promotable. Who knew? I, I started making more money and then, so by the time that I got married, oh, I became lovable too because I got married. Look at that, you know? Yeah. All kinds of things started to, to come into place because I changed the what I was focusing on, what I was finding important, what I was spending my time with. And then um, about this time, got married, and the company I was working for was going to go under. Like, they were being bought out by another company, and if you stayed, you were going to be moving to Massachusetts. Well, that wasn't an option for me. And um, so I met with mom and dad and I just said, well, um, you're going to hire me. <laughs> it's about how it went. You're going you're gonna to bring me on board because this book changed my life. It changed my work life. It changed how I view myself. I mean, it did so many amazing things for me and I want to work for the man who wrote it. And this is, these are my skill sets and this is what I'll do for you and this is how much money I'm willing to make, which was half of what I was making currently. And they, um, I kind of gave them an offer they couldn't refuse. And I said, just give me a six month contract. And at the end of six months, if, if I haven't proved myself, you can let me go. Or if I just don't like working for you, I promise I'll work for you for six months. But if I don't like working for you, I then, I'll, then I can quit with, with no hard feelings. And so it was kind of an easy thing for them to agree to. And then I've been here ever since. There's so what did you do in that first later. six months to prove, prove yourself? Well, I, I took, they had, uh, mom and dad had been running the company for 40, I, well, how many years at that point? I guess 30 something, we almost, almost 30 years. So this is 2003, however long that is. And, um, but they, they didn't have a database at that time of customers. Um, I don't, I don't know that they had a, a strategy of retention of customer. Um, and so we had come together and they, but they had a, a stack of orders like the people had ordered and with contact information it just wasn't in an organized computerized system and so my first task was to put everybody into a database but I wasn't just going to put people in a database without knowing if the data is valid valid or important so I would call every single person I think there was over 800 people that I called in the first couple of months to number one, make sure I had their contact information correct. Number two, ask them if they wanted to be on our email list because I had started a um, an email newsletter too. And and three, make sure that they still wanted wanted communication from us. And also, um, do you know what other products we have besides the one that you already have? And what sport are you in? And I wanted to just I just talk to people. I just call them and ask them all kinds of questions. Probably need to do that all over again, you know. But now we have. A lot more than 800 people, so. Yeah, <laughs> my, my a lot take more than 800 down. people in the, in the database. Right, the database has kind of grown. So it's one of, it, it was it was eye-opening. It was so cool because some of the people I talked to were in amazing sports that I didn't know anything about. I mean, we talked about pageantry earlier, which is which is one market I'm in, but I'm also in dog sports. Oh, one of the, one of the first ladies that called after I started working for dad was in dog obedience. I'm like, what is that? I have a dog, but he's not obedient. Like, what, what do you, what do you mean? And, and so then that opened up opportunities. Um, so yeah. I, I started reaching out to, to magazines back then when people read magazines, um, starving challenge magazines, would you like to have someone write for your magazine? And then next thing you know, dad's writing for clean run magazine, which is a publication for dog agility handlers because they didn't have anybody uh, working on the middle game at that point in time for their magazine. I'm like, what about this guy? Apparently, people in dog sports are reading with winning in mind, and he's the author. They said, sure. Yeah. So, I mean, some things just just making connections, calling people. That was my primary. Goes game. back to that networking that we talked about earlier. Yeah, it makes it easy because I and I also had the attitude that this person wants to talk to me today. I'm gonna call <laughs> this person here. This I have this person's contact. They want to talk to me. 
and I would just call him and I you know I got hung up on, but it doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. that's that's the hard. And, and it's not like you're cold calling people. No. But if you cold calling's got to be one of the toughest jobs out there if you're in the sales oh. industry. I did that for a short period of time and uh, hated it. You're calling someone who doesn't know really mm-hmm. much about you, doesn't know you at all, doesn't know the company, maybe no slight about it. Mm-hmm. And then here you are calling them and they're like, why Why am I talking to you kind of thing. At least they're they're familiar. They bought a product and that kind of stuff. So some of the times they're probably like, oh, my gosh, you're calling me. This is great. You know, yeah, yeah what's going on? And other times you're like, yeah, but, you know, mm-hmm. but it's not like a mm-hmm. cold car thing. But the the similarity is I've got to call someone. Mm-hmm. I want to get some information. But you're going in there with the right mindset, the right attitude that, mm-hmm. hey, these they want to talk to me. They just don't know it yet. Well, but they're gonna they're gonna want to talk to me. I think that's yeah. a huge, you know, thing going into each call. At least mm-hmm. from the mental side of it, that's really cool. And I genuinely wanted to talk to them. I was super curious. I was super excited. I was super motivated. I just I wanted to work for a company that made people's lives better. Like that made me happy, and I just wanted to talk to people. And so that's what I did. Yeah. And that led to sales, which then led to you being in charge of kind of customer relations, mm-hmm. and then a few years. Go well, about two or three years go by. Mm-hmm. I'm on board full time, you're on board full time. Things are moving in the upward trend, mm-hmm. and dad actually gets kind of roped back into pageantry. Kind uh, of, well, I roped him back in, yeah. Oh, um, you were the guilty one, yeah. I was, well, well, what happened was, um, when Morgan Matlock won Miss Texas in 2005. Her mother was my stage presence coach when I used to do pageant. And so she was fabulous, and Morgan's fabulous. And um, prior to that, so right about that time, I'm like, why? I want to get, I remember this because I watched her win on TV, and I'm like, oh, that's so awesome. Um, and I wanted to get, I was like, I kind of want to get involved again. And so at this point, there were message boards for pageant. I didn't have any clue how to get involved. I think I had maybe emailed the Miss Texas organization. I have no idea, but I I didn't really know how to get connected. And my husband, Rich, had said, you need a hobby, and you better – you need to go find something that you can do for fun. Her husband, by the way, professional hobbyist. Absolutely. He's always got something going on. Yeah, but when he he gets into something, he gets good at it. It, Yeah. It's it's not like he's floundering. He's like, no, I'm going to – you know, I'm going to wakeboard. I'm going to wakeboard. Yeah. You know, if I'm going to get into something, I'm getting into it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I'm going to succeed at my hobby. So if I'm going to be doing this a couple days a week, you know, you might be doing something a couple days a week. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It made sense that I would have a hobby because the hobbies he had, I wasn't interested in. So I needed to have my own thing that I could do outside of, um, and hopefully like outside of work and outside of the marriage and go have something fun that I could go do for myself. You mean wakeboarding, barbecuing, just doesn't, those type of things don't Uh, interest you? No, no. And that's okay. (laughs) Pageantry doesn't interest him either. So it's all good. But I, I remember I wanted to just get involved. I had been a participant. I had been a director for a short period of time. I'd been a judge. I'd been around um, the Miss America organization for a while. And then Morgan had won. And I'm like, wow, I really, I miss being involved in these things. And, and it hadn't been that long, but I, I felt like there's there's got to be something that I can do. And so I posted on a message board, and I, I just said, I'm interested. I, I live here, and I'm interested in getting involved with a local send me an email. But I didn't, you know, put my name or that I had any – I mean, no one knew who I was. And Jan Mitchell, who at the time was the local director for the Miss Plano Frisco organization – um, was the only one to contact me, which isn't, sh- which does is not shocking because Jan is like one of those people that, hey, there's a warm body that wants to help. Let's find him a job. You know, she's she's really um, highly motivated, positive, encouraging individual, and she she contacts me and she says, let's find a place for you. I said, okay, great. When do you want to meet? And so, mom and I went and met with her. And by this time, I have Ashley's my daughter, and so she came with with me too. And we met them and told them a little about who we are and what we do. And they were fascinated by mental management. And I'm like, I really want to test the theory, would mental management work for pageantry? And so we started sponsoring 
their organization. And dad did, he did a one-on-one -on -one basically, like a group, not a one-on-one -on -one, I guess, but a, but a group class for them. And then I worked individually with, with the girls after that. And, and they did really well. I mean, their girls that year were successful. So, um, and then that just started a, I mean, I, I have Shyla Phillips to thank for really um, opening up people's eyes to mental management because... Yeah, but most people have no idea who Shyla Phillips so is. So Shyla, which shout out to Shyla, you are a special human and I love you. She and, and Heather Hodges, who was, who was the other Miss title holder, both of them were competing at Miss Texas that year for, on their first try. So one gets Miss Plano, one gets Miss Fresco, right. and they both compete for Miss Texas. Exactly. Okay. And then there's teens, too. Um, um, Aaron Hunt was was one of the teens. I can't remember who had which title. And then um, Morgan Fuller was the other teen. And so those were the four girls that we got to sponsor for Miss Texas that year. And everybody everybody did well. The two Miss title holders had never been to Miss Texas before, so it was their very first try. And I'm new enough that I don't know that that's rare. Like, I, I don't know that it's rare that you would be a double preliminary winner and top five your first try at Miss Texas. I hadn't been involved in pageantry in Texas for a tremendous amount of time. I, I had no clue how rare that was. And then on top of it, Shiloh won. Um, and so she won Miss Texas on her first try and then goes on to Miss America and is first runner-up. And So she, she competes in Miss Planet Fresco, first pageant ever. She enters. She yeah. She wins her first local. She wins her first time at state, and she's first runner up to Miss America. It's it's tremendous. And and oh, and she was the first um, black woman to hold the title of Miss Texas. So it was historic. Yeah, Absolutely. big deal. Absolutely. Now, and yeah. and she and she's um, she's a remarkable student. She's a remarkable performer. She had a tremendous amount of ability, and um, I remember. At her homecoming, she had given some praise to mental management to my dad and to myself, and then that just kind of opened up more opportunity, opportunities where people were interested. So it just kind of – I didn't really plan to coach. I, I hadn't thought about it. It wasn't something that I was seeking to do. And then um, we had this um, – I guess it was kind of like a fun – it was, it was a – it was a fundraising thing that we had that we did, and we were filming it. And Shyla came and she spoke, and I did a speech. You did a speech. Everybody had to speak, and then there was some entertainment. And um, I remember after that, I got my first phone call from someone who says, I want my daughter to train with you. And I'm like, okay, great. She's like, how much does that cost? And I gave a price, and I set a time. And I put them on my schedule, and I ran into your office, and I said, oh, my gosh, I have a student. What do I do? Like, <laughs> what, do, what do I teach them? And I had been – I mean, I'd been teaching the information, but but for free, for, for sponsorship, for, you know, not there's not as much pressure. And this time I was like, whoa, what do I do? Oh, my goodness. And and you said, well, this is what I do. And I took I, – you basically tutored me on what you were teaching – at that time and gave me kind of a, I don't know if you remember that, but I was like, tell me, tell yeah. me, where, where do I go? What do I? And I went to you because you worked primarily with the younger crowd. And, um, and I was less intimidated to ask you than I was dad at that point in time. <laughs> yeah, high school, collegiate, <laughs> high school collegiate age mm -hmm. individuals, <clears throat> I like working with them best. One, they don't have a whole lot of negative baggage, so to speak, when it comes to the mm -hmm. mental game. They, some of them might have more than others, but take someone who's 40, mm -hmm. competing a long time. They got a lot of years that they could develop some bad mental habits. Mm -hmm. Where if they're 18, I mean, how many, how many years have they got to really get bad mental habits? And a lot mm -hmm. of things that they're doing is just because it's socially acceptable to do, you know? Oh, yeah. Like, I'm not sure about pageants. Well, this may be interesting. You tell okay. me if, if pageants like this in golf, it's socially acceptable do you complain about the way you play when you're done, about your bad performance? In pageantry, do they do the same thing? Are they hard on themselves afterwards? Or is it a different environment to where they say, no, 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 we, we don't really go down that route? Or is it just socially acceptable to be upset and complain when you don't do quite as well as you want, even though it might not have been that bad? I, 
I think it's a little different in this sense because because it's subjective in grading and because you're competing with other people for one opportunity and only one person is going to be successful. I think a lot of times the the beating themselves up happens internally more than more than out loud. A lot of times girls might want other people to think they did really well, even if they don't think that they did. Um, but at the same time, the internal dialogue of well, that wasn't good, or that judge didn't like me, or I just don't feel like I did a good job is definitely there, and it's it's really difficult to get them to see. Initially, it's just really difficult to get them to stop until they realize what that does to self-image. Once they understand how self-image impacts performance and how self-image grows, that's when they realize, wow, I cannot be that way anymore. And then everything changes. And then it's really important that you get – the directors, the parents, you know, the support team of that girl to also buy into the idea that protecting and building her self-image is, is vital to her success, then you really have a chance at some success. Yeah, self-image is really, really huge. And one of the things that when you were getting into pageantry, I always thought it was interesting because it wasn't really big in the beginning. It was like mm-hmm. a lot of work is being done, but there's not a whole lot of traction being done. And mm-hmm figure way to where we can make it profitable for the company kind of thing. And it wasn't that long, shortly after that, a couple of years later, all of a sudden people are reaching out to you directly. Mm-hmm. It's been that way for the last decade where people reaching out, seeking you, and then expanded not just in pageantry but beyond other areas. Mm-hmm. Anything really doing with performance, mm-hmm. you know, people are, are seeking you out. People have to interview to get into certain universities. That I think is really cool mm-hmm. where – I, I never knew I mean, that existed where there were people that, you know, trying to get into like grad programs or, or mm-hmm. certain type of school programs. They have to go through an interview type phase and they don't do good. It could keep them from, mm-hmm. you know, attending a school and fulfilling their dream. And that kind of took off. Yeah. And so really anything that has to do with judging in any form or fashion, mm-hmm. you kind of excel in in that area. So, yeah. How, I, how is it working with people? interviewing to get into university or to get a position for a job versus interviewing in a pageant. I mean, there's some similarities, it's, right? It's not that much different. I mean, at the end of the day, you need to know what you want to tell them. Like you need to already know, you need to already believe that you're capable of being someone that they want for that position or that school or that opportunity. So you need to have the self image that you can succeed in that scenario. And you need to also practice um, you need to have an idea of what you want to say. You need to know how to answer the key questions that you know could be asked. So some of the, the same strategies are very, very similar. In fact, how I started getting into helping people with interview for other types of interviews outside of pageant was through pageant people. They would they would go ahead and, and finish their pageant career because pageantry has an expiration date um, or at least certain sections of pageantry. You can find a system you can compete on. Um, no matter how old you are, probably, but most, this, most required that you, that age, you out. age out. Right. Okay. And so, and so what happens is they would be moving on to something else in their life. So we, we interviewed Jania the other day, great example. She decided not to participate in pageant anymore, but then wanted to go into grad school, needed to prepare for those interviews and for the tests that she had to take and all of that. Well, then she ranges back out. Okay. Help me prepare for this. So, it started that way or somebody – I mean one time somebody messaged me because their daughter was going to be preparing for a lieutenant tryout for a drill team and they do an intensive interview process. And they contacted me and said, hey, I got your information from someone who knew that you helped pageant and this is similar. So can you help my daughter? Yeah, I can. And um, and I've helped young boys even to, to prepare for their interview to get into – you know, a private school when they're in middle school to get into a private high school, there's it's the same strategies, it's the same ideas, it's the same concepts. It's just a different application, but it's how to focus, how to build your self image, going mm-hmm. there prepared, knowing what to say in advance. Okay, so let let's end with this. Let's end with some of the key things over the years that are your favorite type of things to whether they're they're points that are being made, principles that we, we teach, what are the just give us a couple key things that you think are really viable over the last decade or two that you think, you know, for me, 
Yeah, these are really, really important. I, I, well, the, the first one that comes to mind is that you're, you're not ever rejected, you're just redirected. And because in any subjective graded element, any subjective graded sport, you're going to have times when you don't succeed and it's not your fault. That's pretty cool. You're not rejected. You're just redirected. You're just redirected. You are not, you are not being rejected. And, and, but you are being redirected. There's something else maybe that you need to go and pursue or do that you weren't going to be able to do. I mean, God has something else in store for you, and that's okay. Um, along those lines, it's really okay for God to bless someone other than you every now and again. And that's something that it was important for me to think about because you won't always win. You could be, this is what's hard with subjective graded sports, especially pageantry. I mean, you could do everything right. You can do everything 100% and then still not quite succeed. But it wasn't that there was anything that you did wrong. But it's okay that God bless someone else. That, that That's all right. But it's also understanding that just because you might not have been given the opportunity, it doesn't mean you didn't deserve it. And there's more than one person deserving of the win on stage. In regular sports, you know who wins because you know the results. Like you can see the scores. You, you know they were the fastest or they were the strongest or they had the best score. You can tell there's a clear winner. In pageantry, there's not. There's more than one person deserving of the title on stage. And when you realize that, like, you can be happy no matter what happens as long as you did your best. That has to be your goal. Um, and then the other one that comes to mind to me if I'm not going to go mental management principles, I'm just going to go things that I've no, learned any, along any, the way. Whatever you, you think. Um, I, you have to be careful not to make assumptions that people believe or think the same way that you do. And in, in pageant prep, what's really cool and interesting is you have an opportunity. You have a, a diverse judging panel that are from all walks of life, different ages, different, just different backgrounds, and they view things different, different ways. And just because you see something one way doesn't mean that other people are going to see it the same way. And that everybody's valuable even if they don't believe the same way, even if they don't look at things the same way. Every human is valuable. And everybody has something you can learn. No, so no matter who you are, there is something that you can learn from pretty much anyone if you took the time to listen. And so being not making assumptions about people, being really open-minded to learning from them, no matter no matter who they are or if they're com if they can believe or think completely differently from you just to be humble enough to listen and to try to learn because that's part of what happens in in pageant prep is you're influenced by a, a tremendous amount of different people and you have to have a, your thoughts and opinions on all kinds of topics that a lot of us don't even want to talk about and so being really really gracious and willing to give other people the benefit of the doubt is really cool yeah, those are two really, really important ones. I think the the being willing to listen, mm -hmm. to try to understand their exactly. viewpoint or whatever whatever it is, it's very hard for some people. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just, it's the same as, it's much easier to focus on what I don't like about my environment mm -hmm. instead of focusing on what I need to, to look at, which is what is right. good in my life, which is what you started out earlier. Right. But I do like the redirected thing because I think a lot of people think, no, I was re rejected. I'm not good enough to do mm -hmm. this. This person said this. When it could be viewed a totally different, it's like, okay, wait, what they're am I just learning? directing me into, yeah, the learning phase. What am I supposed to learn about this to move mm -hmm. forward? So if someone said to say, look, you, you, know, I don't, you might be able to think you can sing, but you can't sing. Mm -hmm. Well, is that telling me that I can't or is it telling me that I need to go find someone to help me mm -hmm. so I can elevate that? I, I truly believe you have a burning desire to be good at something. Like if you have an internal desire, you really want to succeed at something. The hard work might just work out for you. Putting in the energy, putting in the effort, putting in the hard work, if it's feasible to do, you might actually become pretty gifted at that over time. Where the natural talent isn't what matters as much as that willingness and that passion that you put the effort in. And, and that's what happened with me. I, could, I, I couldn't carry a tune in a bucket, really. I mean, I, I, maybe I had some raw talent, but it wasn't until I put in a lot of work that then, oh, I could win talent at a competition, finally. Yeah, raw so. talent alone isn't enough to succeed. You have mm -hmm. to know how to use it. Yep. So maybe there's a little little hidden talent there that blossomed mm -hmm. later on. Apparently there and, was because I won the award. Well, yeah, and then <laughs> and then you wouldn't have won. You wouldn't have won. I don't care how big or small the, the mm -hmm. pageant is. What percentage of 
of the talent part counts for pageantry. It's a good yeah. percentage. So mm-hmm. if you're if you're not very good, you can't. You, it's going to be very hard to win if you're bottom in the talent. Yeah. Well, if you're competing in a system that has talent, absolutely. Yeah. So so you you could have been too bad. You must you must have gotten better and better at singing. Yeah. And, and so forth. And Heather can sing, by the way, now. So she <laughs> she might be downplaying a little bit. So tell people, remind people who may be looking at this and saying, okay, you know what, I am in this type of area. Heather probably can help me. How do they find you? How do they get in contact with you? And close this out, if you will. So um, mentalmanagement.com is our primary site. If you're interested in reaching out to me, just email info, I-N-F-O, at mentalmanagement.com. It comes to me anyways. I still run all the – I'm still the customer relations person as well. And if you're interested in learning more about how I can help you, you can do that. You can call our office, 972-899-9640. Um, another thing that's I'm really excited about the fact that we've started a Patreon membership. So we have a Patreon account now where you have different levels. I have a ton of articles that are pageant specific that are housed on that Patreon. And some of the articles that we have, some of the ones that dad had written for those magazines are also on there that, that really relate to anyone. And so I highly recommend checking that out. And there'll be a link in the description here to where you can check out that as well. And then what we're doing is we have these different levels that you can join us. And one of them is really just all the written content. The next level, we have some added added video and we'll probably do a, a continuation here in a minute where we'll go in deep dive into some more things that we can put onto that level. And then our gold level members have a chance to ask questions and get their questions answered. So I'm really excited about that. So if you really want to train with us, I highly recommend you check out the subscription-based program. So go ahead and like this video. If you if you liked it, share it with other people. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, and we'd be happy to have you join us in one way or another with our with our company and with what we're doing. So thank you so much.